Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for your patience. Um, I'm Victor Mills, Chief Executive of the Chamber. Thank you for your company um, and welcome to this webinar on how scenario planning can help you chart your post-COVID-19 future. This ghastly pandemic has not only caused tremendous upheaval, not only to public health, but also to business and jobs, but it also allows us time to pause and think, what is our response going to be? What is the future going to be? And how do we best position our businesses to not only survive, but thrive? I'm delighted today to have four very clever gentlemen who've come together to share what they believe are the, the key scenarios that we should think about. And I think they're going to let us into the secret of which they think is the most likely scenario that we need to plan for and strategize around. Um, I'm delighted to have Andreas and, and Matthias here with us. And they're going to introduce a couple more speakers during the presentation, Abhijit and Anand. And we're delighted, gentlemen, to have all of you here today. Thank you so much for sharing your research with us and for taking us through what is um, a very intelligent approach to how we should plan and how we should strategize and how we should execute. Ladies and gentlemen, at the bottom of your screens, you'll see there's a Q&A function. At any time during the presentation, please type in your questions. Um, you'll be able to um, upvote those that you think are particularly pertinent um, and uh, our wonderful presenters will do their level best to answer as many questions as possible. So without further ado, um, I'm going to hand you over to Andreas. I'll be back at the end of the webinar just to make some very brief closing remarks. Andreas, over to you, thank you. Thank you very much, Victor, for the kind introduction. And uh, thank you for the Chamber of having us today. A warm welcome from our side to all participants to this webinar. Um, I'd like to uh, briefly introduce um, some of our colleagues who are with us on the call today, as Victor had mentioned. Um, so besides Matthias and myself, Anand has been working on uh, some of the findings that we will present today with us. Anand has been a, uh, a strategy advisor for over 20 years and used to work with Monitor Deloitte. We also have with us Abhijit. Abhijit is a career banker with uh, over 30 years of experience. And in his most recent job, he was the CEO of BNP Paribas Securities in Singapore and India. So what we'll talk to you, uh, what we'll talk with you about today is how scenarios can be a useful tool in managing through times of unprecedented uncertainty. Um, as a group, we have done in our strategy development and advisory experience, we've done a numerous scenario related pieces of work. And as the COVID crisis broke out, we came together as a group and we said, let's take our skills and our experience and try and think through in a somewhat structured way, how this crisis, at least over the next 12 to 18 months, might play out. And that's what we wanna be sharing with you today. Um, if any of what we talk to you about today is of interest, um, we would be very happy to share with you the publications that we've done. These are the three publications on the left side of this page. Um, in April, we released the original set of scenarios called Breaking the Chain. And then in May and in June, uh, based on the positive feedback we've received from business executives and also from some policy leaders, we've decided to track the evolution of the crisis against our scenarios. And this is documented in the paper called Fractured World and the second scenario update. Coincidentally, if the topic of scenarios is of interest in general to you, um, the current Harvard Business Review from July and August has a lead article on the history of scenarios and shares some, uh, some use cases if uh, that might be of any relevance. The way we want to talk about, uh, about the, uh, our findings is first we want to share the global COVID-19 scenarios that we've developed. Um, after that, 
we want to uh, take a step back and think uh, one a bit more in general of how you can use scenarios as a tool in unprecedented times such as these and also share some of the implications that we see coming from the scenarios that we've developed. Third, Matthias will then take over and he will share with you one way of developing scenarios, so a scenario methodology. Because even though if you read some scenarios, they look like you know, they kind of fall from the sky, but in fact they don't. They are research-based, they are following a procedure and a process, and that's something Matthias will be sharing. And at the end, we'll wrap it up with some Q&A. We have a big group and this is a webinar, so we can't obviously um, have a lot of one-on-one -on -one conversations, but we will try and make it a little bit interactive and we have prepared a few polls along the way and we'd encourage you to take a few seconds to join these polls. This will be hopefully making it a little bit more lively. To get started, um, if you could uh, try and use the uh, Q&A a function at the bottom of your Zoom screen and just type a few words along an answer to the following questions. What are the emerging challenges to your organization as a result of COVID-19? We'd be curious to kind of get a feel of the room, the virtual room of what these challenges are. Uh, maybe you take a minute or so and uh, we will then kind of get a read on the answer before we proceed and dive into the topic from our end. So if you could take a minute and send us some of your thoughts on this. We are getting some answers. We'd encourage some more people to uh, share some of the thinking. So what we can see, and I please keep on sending your, your views, but what we can see is that there are some fundamental questions about the sustainability of the businesses and business continuity on the one hand. Um, we're seeing questions of future of demand, how that will play out, um, how to adapt to this new environment and this new world that is unfolding. Um, questions about financial sustainability, um, also questions about the health of employees and the ability to engage staff, probably in the context of working uh, remotely. So these are very typical uh, sort of concerns that emerge from this crisis. Um, what we want to do is uh, we want to get into sharing some of the views that we have on, on COVID. And before we go into these scenarios, uh, we want to take a step back and uh, reflect on the unbelievable amount of media coverage that we've had. I mean, in particular in March and in April, I think it would be fair to say that the news went on 24 by seven with new insights, new information uh, and sound bites of what's happening in the world. And even today, I mean, either here are just some news clippings that we've put together in five minutes uh, one day ago of uh, the news coverage that talks about the views on how the vaccine might play out, new regional hotspots, second rise in cases, the total number of infected people, and so on and so forth. Um, we, of course, live in an unprecedented age of information coverage. We also live in an age of unbelievable misinformation. We have to, I think, acknowledge that as well. Uh, two pieces of information we'd, we'd kind of can ask you to digest with caution. One of them are the reported number of daily new cases. Here is kind of the trend line as of uh, the global numbers as of Wednesday this week. 
which shows the steep rise in March, then kind of a, a flattening out of new cases in April, and then a uh, not so steep rise from the middle of May onwards. These numbers, even though they are sort of the only numbers we have, are highly problematic. And they are problematic for reasons of a lot of countries that are contributing to this global number are not testing the infections appropriately. They don't have the capability. They don't have the laboratory equipment and so on and so forth. Um, so these numbers are very, very difficult and very, very patchy. Second, a lot of cases are not caught by any kind of testing setup because people who are infected uh, with the coronavirus 2 uh, are in fact uh, not showing any symptoms and might not even be captured in any kind of test. Uh, comparing these numbers by country is therefore equally difficult. And even though that is something that the public media is always jumping on, we, I think this is at best a, uh, an indication of the magnitude of the challenge. The true number of infected cases will be by a multiple uh, higher. And if that multiple is five or 10 or 20 is anyone's guess, we don't really know. The second piece of information you have to digest very carefully are the reported number of daily deaths. It is not always clear if COVID related deaths are tracked appropriately per country. There have been studies done where some countries have now showing an excess capacity of deaths relative to the expected level of deaths in kind of normal, if you want to call it that way, circumstances, and they match the COVID reported deaths against that. Uh, some countries are capturing a lot of COVID deaths as part of their excess, excess ones, others are not. Um, if people are dying with COVID or because of COVID is another kind of set of issues that is not fully understood yet. So again, these numbers are, you know, indicative at best. Independent of kind of the impact of this, of course, we are here to reflect on the economic impact of the crisis. And uh, we just picked some fairly prominent voices in the business community, all in this case from the finance community. You know, the Larry Finks, the CEO of BlackRock, or Ray Dalio, one of the biggest hedge fund managers, or Dr. Doom, IEI Nouriel Roubini, who by and large all recognize that we are at the cusp of an unprecedented economic challenge that is far greater than the 2000 and two, 2008 and 2009 crisis. Um, that's the situation we're in. Um, before we kind of now share with you our scenarios of how this all might play out, recognizing the uncertainty on the underlying numbers and on the economic development, uh, we'd like to launch the first poll and uh, ask you, how would you at this point in time rate your level of crisis understanding? Take a minute or two and uh, think about your personal sense for how well are you understanding your, the, the crisis at this point in time. Let's give it a few more seconds and then maybe we can uh, have a look at uh, the results. Can we uh, put up the results here or do I need to stop sharing my screen? There we go. Okay, so we have, uh, I would say a center around the average about half of the uh, respondents say they have an average handle on the crisis, 33% good and 19% and patchy. That's pretty decent, I have to say. Um, one thing is certain, this pandemic gives rise to great uncertainty. And I think if there would be anyone in this virtual room who has clear and appropriate answers for any of these questions that are here on the screen uh, would be in a very good position. Do we really understand the shift of market attractiveness um, that this crisis might bring? Um, there are signs emerging that supply chains are rearranging. How will that in detail play out? 
is certainly not perfectly clear from our perspective. What is the length and severity of the recession? Um, is anyone's guess? We know that this year will be bad. Will next year be equally bad? Are we going to come back economically quickly or not? And when will a vaccine or treatments for that matter be available? And availability being defined as are they showing high efficacy? Are they produced in sufficient numbers? Are they distributed equally and equitably? Uh, and are they giving the immune system response that we want as far as the vaccine are concerned? So these uncertainties linger and they will linger for a while, which brings us into thinking about the world from a scenario perspective, because scenarios are really framed around key uncertainties that will shape the operating context for organizations in the future. And when we came together and in the first paper we put together, we thought a lot about what these main uncertainties that are really determining if the world will be a very relatively rosy place or a very dark place, what these are. And we ultimately, ultimately landed in two of these uncertainties that are important. The first one is the true severity of the illness COVID-19 ranging from what we've called moderate to high. And this in fact is a multi-dimensional axis here. It covers hard data on the measurable new infection rates globally, i.e. by country and then rolled up into a global view. The infection fatality rate. So how many people are really dying after they have caught the virus? Then the question around what is the seasonality response of the virus? Does it flare up? Does it go down? What is the risk of reinfecting yourself if you would have had the virus and you have recovered? What is the length of the immunity your immune system might give you? How does the virus drift? Does it show signs of mutation? And if so, signs for the better, meaning it becomes less virulent or more virulent? And what is the level of herd immunity that is building up in the population of a country and thereby the world over time? So these are all indicators that kind of look at the virus and the illness of themselves. The second dimension in our sense that was critical is to understand the effectiveness of the global response, i.e. individual countries and the world community. And we measured that and we defined that with equally seven indicators, including the policy responses such as lockdown or wearing masks or shutting down bars, etc. What is the actual transmission rate of the virus? What is the ability of healthcare systems in different localities to deal with the number of infected people? Are we having sufficient testing capacity? What is the, the uh, state of vaccine development? What is the level of international cooperation to uh, coordinate, for example, vaccine distribution? And how well do global supply chains hold up? This to us was kind of the human response dimension that was critical. And if you think about these two uncertainties and you, you then kind of mentally go through a process of saying, okay, if the virus is of moderate, the illness is of moderate severity, and we are responding very effectively, the top right quadrant, we are what we've called an early spring world. And in our papers, we kind of detail how this scenario would look like. The highlight messages are, this is a world in which, by and large, the countries around the world respond very well in getting the virus under control without destroying their national economies. The virus is not mutating for the worse, and we will be finding a vaccine roughly within nine to 12 months, and we're gonna make it available, and it's gonna be effective. In other words, we have the virus by and large under control early on, and the vaccine shows up as a game changer, and we can go back to a close world that we used to know at least at the beginning of this year. That would be an early spring. Of course, you take the other extreme where the severity of COVID-19 is very high 
and the effectiveness of the global response and individual countries within that is very poor. We've called that world an abyss. And this would be a world in a scenario in which global supply chains start to crumble. We've had indications that supply chains in different parts, whether it's in electronics or in food, had their hiccups. They have held up by and large so far. Now we imagine a world where the virus mutates. The second strain transmits very, very rapidly. There is no vaccine in sight and is as much more deadly than the first one. Countries retreat to basically just protecting their own economies and their own citizens. Global arrangements and global trade breaks down. The virus is an, an ever-present threat in a physical form around the world and global supply chains crumble. Before, I hope there will be a lot of optimists on this call, but before you quickly dismiss this is, this is a Hollywood story, take a step back and let's ask ourselves, at the beginning of this year on New Year's Day, who would have thought that one quarter later the world economy has almost come to a standstill? Global borders would be closed and we would be all in kind of dire straits, economically speaking, and a lot of people with serious health issues. Um, who would have thought that? So don't let's not dismiss this right away. This is, you know, within the realm of plausibility. You can also, of course, imagine that the crisis in terms of the severity is moderate. The world is not super effective in responding. And we've called that scenario the fractured world. That is a world where the crisis is, is uh, characterized by countries responding in a patchwork of effective, with effective efforts. So some countries respond very well. Other countries don't respond very well. We have bilateral border agreements being put in place. We might find a vaccine, maybe not as quickly as we want. So we have a world where some economies and countries do well and others don't. Well, lastly, we have a scenario where the world is coming together and tries to act in a collaborated fashion as much as possible and countries do their very best and do so well in managing the crisis, even though the virus turns out to become much more severe in terms of its physical impacts because of the second mutation. So you can see these worlds are all different. In that reset world, we would be living in a world where we are defining our lives and our economies around a virus is a constant threat and we have to structure our social lives and our economic lives in dealing with that. That would be kind of the reset world in a nutshell. So when we put this together, and there's a lot of research that went into this, and if you read the papers, you will see some of the details behind it. We thought, we, we don't know where we are. We are somewhere smack in the middle of this, and it co could go anyway. One month later, and in June, we kept tabs on these indicators and we measured where the world is sort of moving within this scenario grid. And our contention is that we are living now in a fractured world. And this fractured world, that's the narrative we literally, literally wrote in March and April, is the narrative in which there is a potpourri of effective and ineffective national responses and lack of a strong global coordination. We are seeing prolonged economic and social crises. We're seeing bilateral crossing arrangements and a vaccine might not be readily available for everybody within 12 to 18 months. The indicators that we're tracking show us that a lot of the things we had mapped in this scenario seem to become reality. So the true infection fatality rate the best estimates now are about half a percent of the people who are infected actually die of the virus. Um, predominantly, the, the death rate is skewed severely towards the, the elderly population, as well as people with pre-existing medical conditions. Second, the uh, transmission rate uh, in view of the policy responses is now greater than one. 
it is a, as you've seen in one of the charts before, best estimate, it's a straight line growth. The virus is mutating, which is very normal for viruses. They always mutate. We do not have an indication that the virus is mutating for the worse at this point in time. In fact, just today, there was a study released um, that shows that uh, potentially the rapid rise of the US infections might be due, might be caused by a mutation of the virus as it was jumping from Europe to the United States and the version that is spreading in the US might be easier to transmit than the other strains that have been found elsewhere in the world, but it is not showing greater mortality. I think we would all agree, at least based on our best judgment, that there is a mix of effectiveness in terms of the international responses. Some countries are, have done very well, other countries have not done very well. There are different levels of testing capability between countries. There have been localities where the healthcare system had reached its limits. Other healthcare systems have, have done very well. It is undoubtedly a situation where we are seeing a deep global recession with high unemployment, and we will talk more about that. Um, we have seen now the rise of bilateral border crossing arrangements, you know, these emerging travel bubbles, and they're more and more coming up uh, every week. Um, where we in the scenarios had predicted that we might not see a vaccine to be found in 12 to 18 months, we are now in a situation where about, about 25 uh, vaccines are in a clinical trial state with over 100 more are in a laboratory state. So there is reason for hope that hopefully some vaccine will be found. Just a side note here, the fact that a vaccine can be found maybe in a record time does not necessarily mean it's gonna be a game changer. And I'll share with you in a second more on this. Finally, um, we had said in this world, the international collaboration would be relatively weak. If you would agree, then the absence of the US and China around kind of a global coordination around the vaccine manufacturing and distribution might be one indicator that international collaboration is maybe not as great as it could be. So by and large, in our view, we are in a fractured world. However, we could still see other outcomes over the next six to 12 months. How could that happen? Well, let's start with a positive on the top right-hand side. If the virulence of the virus drops in summer, if one of the vaccines that are in the clinical trial stage now really succeeds, if there is now better coordination internationally to manufacture and distribute the virus, if that vaccine is effective, we, have, we might take this for granted. Well, if there's a vaccine, it's gonna work. Well, even vaccines have a level of effectiveness, meaning how many percent of the people are actually getting immunization from using that vaccine. The measles is extremely high with 96% of all people who get a measles vaccination are gonna be protected. Not necessarily given that that level of efficacy is gonna be the same for a new vaccine that's gonna be found here. And there's a question around how many people in the population, what share of the population actually want to get vaccinated. Let's say all of this would be positive, then we could see in early spring. You can see that though there are other ways how this could drift into the more negative territory. So if the uh, domestic economies on the bottom right go into a prolonged recession, if the virus uh, mutates and infections flare up and it becomes the new norm. If social tensions rise, if global supply chains break and countries get into a protectionist mode, you know, we might, we might be heading for a not so pleasant time. So any of these outcomes are, in our view, still possible, but currently we are, in our view, in the fractured world scenario. Let's do a, a quick Pulse check, having heard all that and kind of thinking about your own data that you're carrying with you around the, the virus and, and reflecting on, on your lives and your organization, where do you think is the world going to be headed relative to these scenarios in the next three to six months? Or do you not agree with them and you see other scenarios being possible? Let's take a minute to go through this poll. I'd be curious to see how this looks like.
take a few more seconds. Okay, let's see, can we see the poll results? Interesting, so 60% of the people think we will stay in a fractured world. Uh, some think we might be going into a reset scenario, almost 20%. There are almost 10% optimists and 5% who think we might be heading into a darker place. Very, very interesting. It shows that, you know, it's not really perfectly clear. We might have a, you know, a direction of travel at the moment, but it's not crystal clear where we'll be headed. Okay. Let's push on. Um, these were the scenarios and now you might sit there and say, well, that's, that's kind of all of nice and, you know, I kind of get it, but what do I do with this now? So how to use scenarios is really the key point, whether the, it's these COVID scenarios and there are other COVID scenarios out there or how to use scenarios more generally. Let's take a step back and what situations, situations are scenarios actually a useful tool, a management tool, leadership tool. And these situations are unfortunately characterized by this four letter acronym, the VUCA, the situations in which there's great volatility of what is happening in the world. There is fundamental uncertainty. There's also a great deal of complexity and ambiguity how the situation might play out. In plain English, these are situations where you do not have easily a historical precedent or a personal experience that you can rely on. Where you have to expect that as an organization, you're operating in a system, a national ecosystem, an industry ecosystem, where that system response is different and unpredictable to what you've seen before. And it's a situation where you don't have data from the past that would allow you to do a hard nosed risk assessment. Risk assessments are based on statistical data from the past. So in situations of this kind, scenarios are a useful tool. What this means though is you have to move in the way you are thinking from a linear projection and prediction saying, well, we, our organization has seen in the this in the last five years, let's assume it's gonna be like that, plus minus 5% in a year from now or in two or in three you have to give that linear way of thinking up and you have to accept and get comfortable with ambiguity. Scenarios are a non-linear way to anticipate, not predict the future. Scenarios are anticipations, not predictions. And the line on this little diagram on the right tries to get at the non-linearity of scenarios. So that's a very, very important kind of conceptual piece of understanding that comes with working with scenarios. Some people are very uncomfortable with that. They want to know what do we plan against? And the first step, and Matthias will highlight this when, when he shares the methodology, will be to open up your mind and accept there might be different outcomes and different operating contexts possible in the next few months or years or whatever your planning horizon is. And then using that and scenarios you've developed as the backdrop against which you can develop your strategies. So what can you use, for example, these COVID-19 scenarios? Well, you could use them as the backdrop in against which you reflect on the strategic implications for your sector or your organization and use it to stress test the strategy and the plans you currently have in place. Can be done. And we, we've done that with organizations. You, you kind of take a step back and say, if we accept these macro scenarios, because that's what we've really done, as a possibility, what would that mean plausibly for us in our, in our organization? And if that would be implications that we can logically deduct, what does that mean for the strategies and the investment plans and the human resource plans we have in place? Do they still hold true? Do they make sense? 
do they only make sense in one of the three cases or one of the four and so on and so forth. So they become kind of an operating tool that provides the canvas against which you work. You could also say, well, okay, I get it, scenarios are useful, but this kind of macro scenarios that we've presented, for example, that's just too high level. We should do scenarios that are proprietary to us that take a more granular view on either our sector, specific geographies that we are concerned about, technologies that we're concerned about, whatever. You can frame them in any way you want and make them much more targeted and specific to your operating operations. And once you have done that, you can then say, let's use these more granular scenarios as the backdrop against which we stress test our strategy and we, we review if we need to change our direction of travel. The third way to use scenarios as a tool is to use either existing ones that you feel comfortable with or proprietary ones that you might have developed to explore a pivot strategy. Now that's a very specific use, but what we mean by that is there are some organizations that might simply not be able to go back doing business or run the organization the way before COVID-19. It will not be sustainable. And in these situations, there's a whole methodology around developing a pivot strategy in which using scenarios as an external validation point is a very useful way of engaging. So these are ways of how scenarios can be used. We've taken a, a crack at thinking about the macro level implications of this fractured world which according to the poll, about 60% of people believe in, we will stay in. What are the implications? Apologies, somehow the, the icon here is not showing up appropriately. First implication is just thinking about this fractured world. Some countries are, are managing the situation well, others are not. Some economies are okay, others are not. We will be definitely heading for a recession and it's not gonna be me, it's not gonna be a you it's going to be a long recession. And in the fractured world, logically, you would see structural change to an economy. Some business sectors and businesses will not come back. Therefore, unemployment in these spaces in the economy will rise. And until new uh, sectors are strengthened, until new businesses thrive, there will be structural unemployment. We will also see massive government debts, simply because in times of great recession, governments step in as they should, and they invest money, whether it's for infrastructure projects, for reskilling, upskilling, public uh, startup programs, or what have you. You're seeing that at a great level in Singapore, you're seeing that in parts of the European, European Union, you're seeing that in the United States. So we are working and have to accept it's going to be recession time for a while. In a fractured world, in our view, we also see what we've called tribalism. And what that means is because we will not easily and quickly possibly return to this globalized world where we're kind of sharing and trading and moving around all the time, we will see a world in which countries are relying more on self-sufficiency, whether that's from the food production perspective production of PPE, personal protection equipment, supply chain rearrangements where more things that are critical to a national economy are going to be produced at home and not overseas. Therefore, we will see possibly in this world relocation and localization of supply chains and we will see more permanent bubble air bridge and, and corridor agreements. So little tribes that kind of come together and say, I work with you and with you because you're kind of in the same club as me and other good tribes that, that do that as well. Third, and I had mentioned this already, is structural chains. We're seeing, and I will share with you our thoughts on Southeast Asia, shifts in relative market attractiveness as a direct consequence of some countries in the region handling the situation well and others not so well. Um, we are gonna see winning and losing sectors and we will have a number of companies which have to explore strategic pivot opportunities. It is not all doom and gloom. 
if you talk to the venture capital world, um, there's uh, in some parts, there's great excitement. There's excitement because the kind of narrative there is, well, what's happening now was due and was coming anyway. We're seeing the great acceleration of what would have taken maybe a decade to unfold or two decades unfolding now in a few years. So of course e-commerce is gonna boom, of course online education, of course robotics, of course health tech is gonna come and be the new kind of industry pillars that are carrying us globally forward. Of course that is all coming. So new pockets of opportunity are emerging as well. So these are implications we see at a high level from this fractured world. Let me go back to this shift in relative market attractiveness. Um, and look at the region here. Uh, we see here, not all countries in ASEAN, but we see six of them. And the color coding indicates um, the implicit or explicit policy goal that is either to try and eliminate or suppress the virus as much as possible, those would be the yellow ones, or countries which have sort of accepted that they just have to live with the virus in greater numbers in the general population. That's the color coding. The horizontal bars here indicate <coughs> economic forecasts from various institutes and the relative national ministries. So for Vietnam, whether it's local government agencies or the IMF or the ADB or the World Bank, the range for Vietnam of how the economy this year will play out is roughly between plus three and plus six percent or something like that. And you see the ranges for the others. The world economy is currently estimated to contract roughly around five percent, maybe a bit more, maybe a bit less, somewhere in that range. In our view, and this is just our conjecture, so this is us not having done fancy economic modeling, but looking and understanding the crisis, the response of the crisis, and the high level impacts on the economy. We think Vietnam has already been a shining star in terms of economic power and, and growth in the last years, is probably emerging as the relative winner of this crisis. They've handled this very well from the beginning. They've opened up the domestic economy very early and they probably easily will grow 5% a year. You contrast that with, for example, the Philippines, where in our best view, the Philippines will contract by 5% a year. Keep in mind, 21% of the Philippines GDP is driven by international tourism. Keep in mind that the country, without any offense, does not seem to have a good handle on suppressing and managing the infection rates in the country. Um, we think the Philippines is going to be in for a tough ride for a while. Thailand, by the way, interestingly enough, just before this call, I saw a, a report from the Bank of Thailand that now predicts that Thai economy will contract over 8% this year. So in our previous estimate, it was roughly around minus 5%. Singapore, of course, is a bit of a special case. As an island state with huge uh, that depends hugely on exports and open economy. It is particularly hit hard uh, by the fact that the world economy had come to a grinding halt, of, of course. The, uh, I think MTI uh, is predicting roughly around the minus five, minus seven percent range of contraction. We think it might be even more, depending on how the crisis will play out in other parts of the world. It's not necessarily in the control of Singapore itself. But in our view, this shifts a little bit. If I would be doing business in the region, I, I would you know, think of these countries where I engage in, in terms of investments. Furthermore, given the fact that the good old, let's fly to a meeting in Bangkok today and to a meeting in Manila tomorrow, that world is not on the cards this year and maybe not forever uh, and maybe not next year. How do we, how do we, run our business model? How do we have to rethink designing our value offer? Do we need to uh, engage more strongly with local partners? Um, do we need to have a different regional business development and sales model? These are all questions I think that for some businesses are emerging. 
sector implications uh, in the fractured world, of course, the, the winners, and I had mentioned them already, there are sectors that are very, very, in very, very tough waters, whether it's hotels or anything related to international tourism. I mean, what, there's not much you can do except slash costs or hope for a bailout. You might have be forced to close the business or sell the assets. The one that is interesting uh, is kind of the, the group that's in the middle, those that have been hit hard, but have reason to believe that with adjusting their business model um, and getting through the crisis, there might be kind of a second wind they can catch. Uh, and these are businesses that I think need a lot of work and a lot of thinking in which scenarios could be a useful tool. Let me, uh, let me stop kind of our thoughts on this fractured world, which are very high level, they had to be, um, here and ask you in the next poll, how well do you think your organization is handling the crisis at the moment? Let's give it a minute. How well is your organization handling the crisis at the moment? Can we see the uh, poll answers? So I would say about 40%, 38% on a, say average. 40%, which is very encouraging, good or excellent. That's, that's very good to hear. And 21% patchy. That's, uh, that's quite interesting. It's better than I had, a, had expected. I think with that, I will, uh, I will stop here and I'll hand it over to Matthias, who will uh, talk to you a bit about the scenario methodology. Matthias, you're on mute if you're talking. Hey, thank you, Andreas. Okay, so the next, um, yeah, maybe 30 minutes. We'll talk a bit about the methodology that we use to create the scenarios that Andreas um, presented. Um, there are different ways of uh, building scenarios. Uh, so we'll be discussing uh, one very common way, uh, which is the one that, that uh, we used for, for our COVID scenarios. Before we go in that, um, I'd like to also start with a poll. Uh, this time it's um, more about you. The question is, have you used or are you using or are you preparing to use scenarios as a tool to manage your way through this crisis? Okay, maybe you can see the results. Okay, so the, the biggest group says we've looked at some scenarios but didn't use them. About half said we didn't really use them, but there's also another half who say you are using them. That's actually quite impressive. And there's even 3% of you saying you have an institutionalized scenario development capability in your organization. Very good. Okay, let me start by just briefly going back in time 
um, and talk about the history of scenario thinking. It, it actually came out of the Cold War. Um, it came out of the confrontation between the West and the East, if you like, uh, specifically out of the, the RAND organization in the US that in the 60s tried to develop new uh, tools to anticipate and play through different ways of the, the way the confrontation could work out. So they developed things like scenario techniques, uh, war gaming, uh, and other uh, tools that you might be familiar with that have since been moved into the commercial world. Um, the, one of the key people at the RAND organization who drove this uh, happened to bump into the head of strategy at, oil, uh, at um, Shell Oil Company in about 1970, Pierre Wack. And uh, they chatted and Pierre said, oh, this is a really interesting technique. We should try this out in the commercial context. And so he, he uh, adopted this uh, methodology to Shell. And then two or three years later, there was the global oil crisis, if you remember. And Shell used the scenario technique and they felt that it served them really, really well. Uh, so ever since scenario thinking has been a tool that's proliferated um, around the world in the commercial sector and also governments. Uh, for example, in Singapore, the government of Singapore has been using this uh, technique for the last uh, about 20 years. And uh, quite a lot of commercial organizations, as we just saw from the poll, actually in Singapore are using or have been using this tool. So what are scenarios uh, and what's scenario thinking? Um, Scenarios are stories. Uh, they're stories about tomorrow. There's not one story, but as you could see in Andrea's example, there are multiple stories. And the process of thinking through these stories helps uh, organizations navigate uncertainties. That is the main idea. And you can use this technique and you can use these scenarios then to identify possible sources of shareholder value for your organization. What are scenarios and what are they not? Um, this is often a little bit confused um, because companies also do forecasting, they do uh, two year, three year planning and people ask, well, what's the difference? And the difference is uh, very profound. Um, scenarios are, as I said, multiple possible futures and plausible futures. They are not a single view on the future. Um, they are hypotheses and not predictions. They are stories, as I said, and not plans. Although you can then use these stories to inform your planning. They are designed to stretch people's mental maps, to, to widen your uh, perspectives, not to reinforce certainties that you already have. As some projections do, if you make a linear projection into the future on the basis of past experience, and then maybe plus minus a few percent, then you're basically uh, forecasting and just reinforcing what you take to be certain anyways. That's not what scenarios do. Right? As you could see in, uh, in Andrea's example, they are constructed around uncertainties. They are not constructed as, for example, your financial models would be around assumptions. So what does it take to do scenario thinking? Uh, one element is to take the long view and by which we do not necessarily mean it has to be 10 years out or 20 years out. You could see that uh, our COVID scenario is actually uh, one to two years out only. Um, the reason is that our visibility into COVID is, is in our view, very, very short. It's, it's weeks or at best months. And so taking an 18 months view is, or is actually taking a long view. So, so how long the view should be depends on uh, how you how far your visibility goes if it's if it's very short then uh, you know an 18 months horizon for example can be very appropriate 
Um, so the, 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 the horizon that the scenario is taken can uh, differ widely, but the idea is always to take a view beyond what's immediately visible to you. The other element is to encourage uh, diversity of, of views and of perspectives. So to really invite, and as you create scenarios, you have to actually physically invite people into the process who are diverse. So if, if you have the, the same people who work together day by day and who share the same views doing scenarios, they will not be very diverse. Yeah. And the idea here is to really create that diversity and have, take, take an opportunity to uh, explore diversity of perspectives. The third element of scenario thinking is to think outside in. So you start on this picture, you start with the contextual environment, which is things that are largely going to be beyond your control. Things like social change, technology, economic shifts, environmental changes, uh, and a virus would be part of that, and also the political landscape. You start on the outside and try to understand the big picture. And then you move more towards the inside and ask questions such as how is, for example, the consumer going to change? It was actually one of the questions or two of the questions that came up earlier at the beginning were related to how is the, how is the consumer and the demand pattern going to change? So, so that, that sort of comes closer to you. And in that space, if you are a big player, of course, you might uh, actually have some influence how the world will evolve. And then only later or finally, then you bring it back to who you are and to the industry and the ecosystem in which you play. Right? And you look at the things that are more immediately relevant to your business. Right? So you always start from the outside and then work your way in. That's the idea of the scenario creation process or scenario thinking process. So what are the uses of scenarios? Andreas already mentioned some. Of course, traditionally, it's, it's used to define long-term strategy. That's, that's the most uh, you know, common use. But there are quite a few other uses for scenarios. Um, as Andreas said, you can use them to stress test um, existing plans or existing projects or in, in existing investments and also uh, to mitigate risks around those plans or investments. You can use them for any significant decision making under uncertainty, whatever that might be in your organization. You can use them to drive innovation because you can use scenarios to get a view of what might happen in the future and then work your way backwards towards saying, well, what new things could we do innovating new pro pro uh, products, new services, or new processes, or new ways of doing business that suit some of these scenarios. So you can use them as a driver of your, your innovation process. <clears throat> and you can finally, you can use them to align stakeholders in support of a shared vision. And I think one of the questions that came up at the beginning was around how do we sort of engage and, and keep our staff uh, engaged uh, in this in this difficult time and you know one of the ideas is to, to involve them in a scenario thinking process because it it allows them to be part of the exploration and they will feel being part of the decision maker uh, decision making process and being part of the exploration process as to how is the world, the world evolving and how does it relate to us and what are the implications to us so you can use a scenario planning process to actually involve people and make them feel their voices are being heard. So as you go into scenario thinking in, in, in your organization, uh, you're going through three stages. Starting from the context you're in today, the first step usually is to diverge the thinking, to open everybody's minds, beyond the day-to-day -day business, beyond the things that they sort of already know, and, and jointly explore what are those uncertainties, actually, that we're talking about. Are there some givens? Are there some things that, despite all the uncertainty, we are fairly sure are going to happen? 
you know, trends. Right? And what are the dynamics generally that we are seeing? This is the stage, especially where you invite a lot of um, diverse thinkers to participate in the process. <clears throat> now, once you've opened everybody's minds, people then crave to bring it back down to what's relevant to their business or what's relevant to their organization and their decisions that they have to make. And that's where the scenarios come in. So this creating the scenarios allows you to converge the thinking back onto three, four, or five uh, specific scenarios that people can relate to and that people can see how they then relate to the day-to-day -day business. Yeah. As you could see in our example, COVID, we have four scenarios, but it, sometimes it's three, sometimes it's five, but that's about the number you typically have. And you then use, in the third stage, you use these three, four, or five scenarios to explore the implications on your business or your organization. What does it mean for your strategy, for your portfolio decisions, for your risks? Are there new opportunities that maybe you hadn't seen before going through this process and that the scenario thinking actually opened your mind to where you now see, oh, there are actually some new opportunities coming out of the uncertainty that we might want to pursue. There's typically a fairly structured process of building scenarios. Um, and typically, if you start sort of from scratch and you don't already have an initial scenario set handy, you start with doing some research and interviews, interviewing experts, interviewing management, interviewing all the stakeholders to identify what they think are the key uncertainties and trends and also what are their personal views. And then you prioritize the, the most important uncertainties and use those uncertainties to create your scenarios. So in, in our COVID scenarios case, you saw we had two uncertainties which we crossed. Uh, one uncertainty was re related to the COVID disease and the other uncertainty was related to the uh, response uh, of policymakers and organizations. So we use, we picked those two key uncertainties out of a pretty long list of plausible uncertainties. There are many others, but to get to a scenario, you have to pick the most important ones. And then you create the scenarios often that will be done in a workshop uh, with this pot potentially quite a broad participation, 20, 30, 40, 50 people, uh, whatever uh, makes sense to the organization. As I said, this is the opportunity to involve everybody, uh, or not everybody, but many people, um, to, to be part of this creation process. And once you've created some plausible scenarios, you start fleshing them out. So there you go back and do some more homework. You create the narratives. Uh, you, you develop some of the details, how they relate to you. So you go outside in and you know, bring it back down to your organization. And then you develop uh, what may be the key implications for you. Uh, and then you may have uh, another workshop and you may share those implications. And then you really get towards defining actions uh, and aligning, uh, aligning the key uh, participants and the stakeholders around a common view as to how to move forward. Um, and then you basically have a set of scenarios. You basically have people aligned around them and you're ready to use them. And then you start using them in the way we talked about. You can use them to uh, generate new ideas about in innovation. innovation. You can use them to test some of your existing assumptions. You can use them to test some of your projects and your investments that you're currently undertaking or that you're considering to undertake and see how well they uh, perform uh, or stand up to the different scenarios. In sort of in parallel to that, you may then institutionalize, uh, institutionalize these scenarios or this, this scenario creation process by having a small team, maybe in your strategy department, um, continuing to evolve those scenarios. That involves possibly evolving the narratives of the scenarios as you see the world evolving. You may enrich it, you may flesh it out in certain ways. And also it may involve defining a set of early warning indicators 
that tell you where in that matrix of scenarios you may be moving. Right? So you define some uh, indicators that are forward looking and then you keep tracking them regularly and you may report them regularly, maybe once a month, and you, they will tell you, ah, are we still in the fractured world or are we maybe seeing some movement into early spring or are we potentially seeing some movement into reset, for example. So this tracking capability allows you to, at any given time, to have a shared understanding as to where are we relative to these scenarios. So that's in a nutshell the, um, the process you go through. Now in terms of creating uh, scenarios, uh, the first step, as I said, is you, you know, think about uncertainties. And here you see the two we chose. And you think about what actually is the, what we call focal question the scenarios are supposed to address. And what is the time horizon our, our scenarios are so, supposed to cover? And uh, as you see, we, we, we chose uh, 18 months and our focal question was, how would uh, COVID-19 affect our world over the next 18 months? Uh, and then we selected the two uh, most pertinent, most important, most interesting critical uncertainties. And when you create a matrix out of those uncertainties, you then get those uh, scenarios. And the, the four scenarios that we presented, we call that a scenario set. And for each of those scenarios, and you saw that earlier, uh, here's the example again of the fractured world, we then craft a narrative. Now the narrative you see here on the slide is a simplification. The actual narrative in the, in the document is, is quite a bit more detailed. But the, the key here is really that you can continue evolving that narrative as you go along and as you learn new things. So we've got to a stage where we've sort of developed uh, a, a first scenario set. And you may be asking yourself, well, how do I know uh, that, it's a, that it's a good set, that it's effective for me, that it's meaningful, that it's uh, something I should, I should use. And we have four criteria that all need, need to be met. Um, they need to be the scenarios need to be challenging. Um, if there are scenarios that, you know, don't really push you out of your comfort zone, then it's probably not a really interesting scenario. Yeah. All of them need, in some way or another, need to be challenging. Even in a benign scenario, so let's say our early spring, um, that there will be challenges in that scenario. Yeah, so don't think that there is necessarily an easy and a difficult scenario. But in some way or another, usually um, people find when they work with scenarios that in any of those worlds, do they face challenges? Just the type of challenges they face may be of a different uh, nature. Um, they have to be plausible, um, they have to be relevant, and they have to be divergent. So that you can see that there's a tension between these four uh, criteria, because on the one, one hand, you want them to be challenging, so really push the thinking, yet they have to be plausible to people. If, if people around the table say, uh, this is an interesting scenario, but I really don't think it's plausible, I cannot imagine ever in, in any world this, this scenario playing out. So uh, then you challenge people and say, well, think harder, but if people really don't think it's plausible, then it's probably not a useful scenario because people have to believe any of those scenarios could actually happen. If one of the scenarios, if people come back and say, it's interesting, but it's not relevant to my business, I don't see how this narrative of this particular scenario relates to my business and how it helps me make decisions, then it's not relevant. And then you, you, you drop it. Uh, you don't want a scenario that is not relevant to the organization. And finally, they need to be divergent, meaning they cannot be too, too similar. Uh, if you have several scenarios that all look and feel a little bit similar, 
then you have to go back and maybe change one of the uncertainties, you know, and re reframe it to make it more divergent. Because one of the ideas behind scenarios is to really have that wider view of the future than you did before. There's often a bit of a risk that people sort of go back to what they already know in this process. So there's always a need to sort of try to counteract that and, you know, diverge their thinking and challenge them on that. So whenever, if you create your own scenarios in your organization, these are your four criteria that really you need to keep in mind. Okay, so now you've, you've, you've created your scenarios and you've created alignment within your team around the scenarios, uh, whether it's the leadership team or the broader uh, uh, group of stakeholders in your organization. And uh, then people will ask, okay, so, uh, so what? What do we do with these scenarios? Um, and of course, we want to use these scenarios to inform our strategic choices. So the first thing usually that happens is that people recognize that some strategies or some choices work well, more or less equally well, under any of the scenarios. We call those strategies robust. A robust strategy simply is a strategy that works fairly well under any of the different scenarios. So you see here on this chart, the, the matrix. So you think of the four uh, scenarios uh, that we showed you earlier. There will be a set of choices you can make that will be robust. And it's usually always a good idea to make those choices, no matter what. They will serve you well, no matter what. Um, and that's often quite interesting. So, sometimes these choices are not the most interesting ones and they may be to some degree obvious to people, um, you know, and they usually only account for some subset of the total choices you want to make. But it usually helps people to see, oh, okay, I already thought this was the right thing to do, but now I have a much stronger sense of ownership and, and commitment to it because it is robust under the scenarios. So it, it's a reinsurance for people uh, who are responsible for these choices to say, oh, that's a choice we should make because it's robust. So that's usually your first step when you think about your, your choices. Then you have different options. <clears throat> If you strongly believe in one of the scenarios, and we sometimes find in an organization that people align around one scenario that most people believe in. Like in our little poll earlier, I think 60% of the people believed in the fractured world scenario being relevant for the time being. So if there's a very strong consensus within an organization that one scenario is just simply more plausible, more probable, more exciting, it's more sort of suits you as an organization and you believe in it, you could potentially what we call bet the farm. So you could put pretty much all your investment choices into that basket. Now that's a very risky thing to do because remember the other three scenarios are still also plausible, right? And you, you still have uncertainty whether or not we are going into that world. So to bet the farm takes a lot of courage and it happens in our experience not very frequently. Um, the opposite strategy, if you, if you like, would be to say we, we hatch our bets by placing some specific investment choices or strategies against each and every one of the four scenarios. So whichever world plays out, we'll have at least some um, strategies or investments that will serve as well. Now that is a kind of an insurance policy, buying an insurance policy, but most, most management teams don't like that option because they feel they're not really making a choice at all. Uh, that's just playing it safe. And of course it's not really safe because Whichever world plays out, the other three worlds, if they don't play out, you may be losing your investments there. Yeah, so you never lose completely and you may not uh, go belly up, but you never really perform very well. And if there are some players who bet the farm on one, on, on, one of the, on one of the scenarios and that scenario comes about, that player will always outcompete you if you just sort of hedged your bets. 
So we don't see hedging your bets happen very frequently with clients either. Uh, the most common strategy or option, in addition to doing the robust moves, is what we call a core satellite uh, uh, approach. If, a, if an organization has a fairly strong sense that one scenario is more likely uh, or more plausible, maybe in, in this example here, it's the Northwest uh, scenario, they may put the core of their strategy there. So the bigger part of their investments and their attention, they will shape towards that particular scenario. But they will also have some investments, more limited, in some of the other uh, scenarios. So we call those the satellite investments. So you can see that this approach is a bit of a mix between the extremes of betting your farm on the one hand and hedging all your bets on the other hand. And this core satellite approach, and sometimes it's one core and one satellite, sometimes it's one core and two satellites, that depends on the organization. Uh, there's, in most cases, at least one scenario that people say, oh, we don't really believe in that scenario so much, so we, 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 don't, we don't really gear towards that. So that's the most common uh, way um, we've seen people actually move vis-a-vis -vis those scenarios. Okay, um, finally, um, some organizations, and we saw 3% of you said you have been doing this, some organizations institutionalize scenario capabilities in-house. So they may be multinationals, for example, who have a global headquarters, they may have a regional headquarters here in Singapore, and they may have country uh, uh, organizations across ASEAN. And they may want the regional headquarters to have a very good view as to what's going on in ASEAN across those uh, markets where they operate. And they may create, for example, a scenario thinking capability at the regional headquarters, which does sort of two important things. It, it sort of relates back to global headquarters and shares information with them and gives them a sense that you know what's happening in your part of the world. And at the same time, it links the regional headquarters to each of the markets. Uh, the markets would be supplying expertise, they would be supplying data, and then maybe your scenario planner sitting at the regional headquarters will be um, coordinating that and maybe crafting the scenarios and writing the narratives and then communicating them both to the global headquarters and also back down into the country organizations. So we've seen this being a very effective way of uh, doing scenario planning without taking very much resource. Usually you will have someone who does a bit of planning in each of your country organizations. And uh, that planner, for example, could then be the representative on the, on the regional team to do the scenario thinking. Uh, this is one example. There are other uh, examples, of course, how we can organize that. And to establish this kind of a process does not need to be a very a uh, big project, it usually takes something like five or six weeks to, to establish and get it up and running. And once it's up and running, usually people pretty much get into it and, and learn how to do it. So that was a really quick run through as to how do you build uh, scenarios and how do you use them. Finally, one more question going forward. Would you consider using scenarios to manage the crisis? No, unlikely, quite likely, or certainly. Okay, can we see the results? Okay, 94, 90, 94%, 95% say likely or certainly to use scenarios. That's great to hear. Okay, with that, Andreas, over to you. Andreas, you're on mute, I think. 
<laughs> Sorry, now I'm back. Um, so thanks, Matthias. Uh, maybe we can stop sharing the screen. We can just go to the video mode. Uh, we received a handful of questions, so I'll just start picking one um, and uh, give my thought on it, and then I encourage uh, my, my colleagues to either comment on what I say or pick some other questions uh, and address them. Uh, please send more questions if you if something you know strikes you as uh, as very important or you would like to kind of get our view on that. You can also get in touch with us after the session. So I'll uh, address one question that reads. How long does it take to develop a meaningful set of scenarios, including the responses? And how do you balance the rigor of scenario planning with the need to have a business being agile? Meaning, you know, shorter planning cycles, focus on piloting, learning, and adapting. That's a great question. I think the process to develop a scenario and responses is really up to you, to be honest with you. Um, if you have a complex big organization and you want to involve many, many people because the process is as important as the document you get itself, it will take, you know, four weeks, six weeks, eight weeks easily. If you though say, look, we need something to deal with this crisis and I want to get, you know, 10 of my top people involved, one or two external people and that's it and we'll just go through the motions and, and kind of do a best effort. You can do this in two to three weeks. And now using technologies like you know, Zoom or like Miro or other kind of online tools, you can do this fairly quickly. Um, I mean, the first cut of the scenarios we had put together took, starting from zero, took about two weeks. Then we had the first idea of how this will look like. And then you go through a process of refining. Then you add maybe a week to think about implications and responses. So I would say within three weeks, you can get somewhere if you want to. Um, that would be kind of my take on the first question. It's again, a, a question of how inclusive do you want the process to be? Um, second, the question is how do you balance the rigor of this planning with the need to be kind of be agile? Well, I think that depends a little bit on what type of business you are. If you are in an asset intensive business where you need to make hundreds of million dollars of decisions of investing in physical assets, you might wanna spend more time up front thinking about the scenarios and making real sure you're kind of really on top of all the possible evolutions that you can possibly think of. However, if you are, for example, a startup business, we encourage startup companies to use scenarios and we encourage them to rethink that every four to six weeks because they are in the need where, in a situation where they do not have a lot of cash resources, the world is changing rapidly, consumer behavior is changing, technology is moving forward. And if you don't have a runway to sit it out for a year, you need to be on your feet quick. So, this is to me something where you can go through iterative, iterative cycles of planning, revisiting your scenarios, reflecting on implications and, and making calls based on that in probably monthly or bi-monthly terms. That is possible. But if you have major decisions that depend on that, I'd probably take a bit more time. That would be kind of my take on, on this one. Matthias Anand, Abhijit, you want to take some of the other questions or comment on this? Yeah, maybe I'll go on a, on a couple of the questions uh, uh, which, which I found were really, really interesting. Uh, so there is this one question around uh, uh, how uh, is it relevant, is scenarios relevant for SMEs? Uh, um, and is it applicable to SMEs too, or is it more of use to large organizations? Uh, so the answer to that is yes, definitely it's applicable to SMEs as well. As we are all seeing in this COVID-19 crisis, um, uh, much larger impact has been on uh, small and medium businesses. Um, the, the scenarios are views of the world, and, and they do affect small businesses, medium businesses, and large businesses as well. So applying a scenario thinking lens is still relevant for SMEs. I think the underlying question is, can a single SME have the resources and the capabilities? If it doesn't have the resources or capabilities, how can it apply 
scenario thinking. I think that's that's kind of uh, the underlying question behind this. Uh, to me, the answer then lies in, um, and that is where uh, probably uh, chambers such as SICC or other SPFs and other uh, chambers kind of come in, is it doesn't have to be that every single SME has to do its own scenarios. If you're a large corporation like Shell or Keppel's of the world, obviously you have the wherewithal and the resources and maybe even the capabilities to do it. For SMEs, our recommendation would be that uh, you, do, you do common scenarios at sectoral level or at country level, uh, which then is available to SMEs. And then there are tools and templates that uh, a common body for that sector or for that uh, in, uh, association can make available, which then the SMEs can rapidly use to stress test their strategy. That's kind of how, uh, from a practical perspective, we would recommend uh, uh, SMEs to use. So SMEs scenarios are definitely applicable scenario thinking. If you don't have the resources or capabilities, then uh, we would encourage the respective sector association, industry association, or the SME association uh, to undertake that exercise where you get the scale benefit and then deploy digital tools and workshop like led tools, which SMEs can then apply on their own. Just one comment to, to add to what Anand said, beyond SMEs, you can apply this to nonprofit organizations of any exactly. shape or form. I mean, it is really independent of the organizational type where scenarios can be a useful tool. I mean, they've been used in the military, they've been used in the Coast Guard of the US. You can use it for an education institution, et cetera. I mean, there's no limits to where you use scenarios if they're designed uh, appropriately. Anyone else, Matthias? Yeah, maybe one question here <clears throat> that I'm seeing. Um, the question is, um, how can we, given limited resources, how can we get relatively you know, easily from the scenarios to corporate strategy, maybe by attaching a probability to one of the scenarios and, and not sort of get too distracted uh, with so many possibilities? I think that's, that's an important practical question. Um, so, I mean, one thing that has served uh, many of our clients uh, really well is what I alluded to a moment ago, which is to, to agree on what, you, what we call a, um, an official future. So, within your organization, you know, look at the scenarios and say, okay, which one do we really believe in? Right? And then sort of concentrate your minds on that one, um, still tracking the other scenarios, but maybe putting most of your effort against that one scenario. And, and so not to get sort of too dispersed in your, in your choices and in what you do. Um, but what you usually find is that in one or two of the scenarios that you are not maybe picking as your official future, that there is some element in there that someone in your team finds really important. Either, either they like it and say, this is something where there's a great opportunity. If that happens, there's a great opportunity in it for us. Or there's something in it where someone will say, this is a really existential threat to us if it happens. And even if we, are, we don't really believe that scenario is so likely, that particular element we really need to sort of ensure against. So, so you can pick some of the elements of the other scenarios and bring them together with sort of the main scenario that you're sort of uh, leaning towards and, you know, bring it into that, that scenario story so that you end up around the table agreeing on, okay, this is what we think is our official future that we are going for. And then you can concentrate your minds in terms of your choices and your strategies around that. And you don't get too sort of easily distracted, uh, you know, by all the other things that might happen. Yeah, and maybe, build, maybe building on that, uh, one point I would add is we, we are usually careful in putting hard probability percentages or numbers to the scenarios uh, because we found in our experience that that is not practical in the sense it doesn't mean a scenario is you put a 50% probability that doesn't mean you put 50% of your resources behind that scenario. That's not smart strategy. Uh, so as Matthias was saying, either you pick a core and a satellite, which is what we've seen most of the firms do, that you know that uh, uh, there is a there is an official future based on which you develop your core strategy, 
but then you have some satellite uh, pieces that you can pick from other strategy, other other scenarios as add-ons or uh, uh, hedges, for example. Uh, but we would we would be very careful by saying, oh, this scenario is forty-two percent possible, and that one is thirty-eight percent, because to some extent in the practical world, those are meaningless probabilities. We have one question here that takes a step back and says, look. The, the COVID scenarios we presented have two dimensions and that's all good and fine. In reality, we are also dealing with other uncertainties, for example, the US-China tensions. So how do we now integrate that level of uncertainty, kind of overlay that on top of the COVID-19 uncertainty? So one way of doing this is to say, the way COVID plays out becomes one uncertainty. It's relatively benign to very bad. And you, you could say, take, for example, our work and say, we have an idea how good versus bad looks like and kind of the stages in between. And we have, we have some texture how that could look like. It becomes one uncertainty. If you would think the US-China tensions are the second key determinant that drive choices for your organization materially, that becomes your second uncertainty dimension. Then you have the US-China tensions get resolved you know, relatively easily and quickly versus it, it deteriorates and you have to define what that means and you get a new scenario grid. That's one way of doing it. So you can kind of integrate multiple high level uncertainties. Um, you could also say, if you then say, well, we have three or four of these main uncertainties that we struggle with. You have to think if you can group them, that might be one way of dealing with it. Or you play and you have conversations and internally which one of these three or four are actually making a difference to our organization most materially? And you start with those first. You, you have to, somewhere you have to limit the complexity at some point, but you can capture, you can capture more than just a COVID uncertainty for sure in the way you think about this. Yeah, if I can add to that, Andreas, um, first of all, as I said, there are different ways of crafting scenarios. And sometimes if a client simply cannot agree on what are the two most important uncertainties. There are ways of playing around with three or four uncertainties and crafting, you know, different scenarios from them. So you end up having three or four scenarios, but they're not all crafted by the same set of uncertainties. So that's one way of bringing more than two uncertainties together if you cannot agree on the top two. Um, another uh, element is that Let's say you take our COVID scenarios that we presented and uh, we are saying we are currently in the fractured world. You can bring this uncertainty about US-China tension into those scenarios, into the narratives. The uncertainties don't always have to be on the axes, right? The axes are just the most important ones to structure the thing. But in each of the narratives, you can then explore those other uncertainties. So in, in a fractured world, you could have a big, sort of part of the narrative go around, well, how is, for example, COVID maybe accelerating this fracture, whether it's between the US and China, uh, you know, other parts of the world, right? And you, you can easily, I think, build the US-China tension, especially into the fractured world scenario. So, so remember that the uncertainties that you didn't cho choose to sort of uh, craft that matrix, they don't go away, right? They're still there, those uncertainties, and they're still relevant and important, right? You may have created a list of 10 or 12 of them. Don't lose them, right? Because all the, the ones you didn't use to craft the scenario, you can actually explore inside of each of the narratives where it makes sense. And so that way you do not lose sight of those uncertainties. Uh. Uh, I think there's one question uh, which came in a bit earlier uh, about blind spots and biases, and I hope uh, we shouldn't be missing out that question as a blind spot. Uh, so just to respond to that, uh, very, very, very relevant question, and that's why I think uh, both Andreas and Matthias, when they presented, said that the starting point of scenario thinking is divergence. Uh, so it's not just the same uh, uh, set of, let's say, senior managers in an organization who already probably have some of those blind spots and biases continuing to discuss and come up with scenarios. 
So in the divergent part of the process, you actually reach out to others, look at other research or information, or go and interview um, uh, other people who are not from your industry, but maybe from the technology side, maybe from other, looking at it from other policy side and so on. Um, in fact, in some of the workshops that we do, we actually bring in completely tangential people who we call as remarkable people. So these, these may not have anything to do with your industry, may not have anything to do with your uh, particular organization, but they may be an expert in a particular field, maybe in psychology, maybe in because consumer psychology will drive demand, for example, maybe in uh, policy, etc., who then enrich that process of scenario creation. So that's how you address, you need to address one uh, your blind spots and biases, and that's one way of doing it. I think to build on that, a simple way of saying that have someone in the room you can never agree with. That's a good, that's a good way to start because by definition, you know, someone will be coming from a different perspective and then as Anand elaborated, you know, enrich the group is a good way. The second uh, test that you might apply is to say, are the scenarios we're getting really diverging? Because if they're also kind of covering the same, just in different flavors, you haven't opened up the thinking enough. If you only have good or only bad scenarios or all, all scenarios that are shaped by whatever technology being the main driver, then there's something missing. You have to be honest to yourself. I think that's an, another one. They have to be divergent, these scenarios, in order to be useful. Uh, and, and maybe the question around, uh, there's a question around, would you include consumer research data in, in scenario planning? Uh, absolutely, as, as that is another input. Uh, so. Uh, uh, if you if you remember the three kind of circles uh, of three spheres of looking at information, uh, the middle circle is all about how the consumer lifestyle and and how the consumer is going to evolve as a basis of that disruption. Uh, so that definitely uh, uh, would be one of the factors. Whether it is uh, more uh, uh, data data from uh, the qualitative side, be it uh, through, uh, uh, like I was mentioning, uh, uh, consumer psychology and how that's going to change uh, consumer culture. So, so one of the things we looked at in the scenarios is uh, when Andreas said, uh, beat the virus versus living with the virus, a lot of it is linked to culture. So to some extent, why Indonesia is probably choosing to live with the virus is because there is a cultural perception of health risk in society there, which is different from let's say in Europe or in Singapore, et cetera, where it is all about, we need to box, manage the virus, contain it. Whereas uh, in Indonesia and to some extent in India as well, it's more about, it's more fatalistic. We can live with the virus. We know uh, we may not be able to 100% contain it, but we'll manage it. So there's a consumer aspect that comes in already in COVID-19 and in any scenarios to develop that becomes relevant as well. Yeah, you can, you can use the scenarios as a lens to look at your consumer research data again, afresh, and ask the question, well, is it still relevant? And in which of the scenarios is, is what the people told us in that research, you know, or what we found in the research still relevant, and in which scenario maybe it isn't, right? I mean, if the research was done before COVID, there will be quite a lot of stuff in that that may not uh, be, be relevant in any of the four scenarios. But of course, there will be some elements in your research that will still be pertinent. So you use the scenarios to look again at your research data and ask that question. Yeah. How, how does that lens um, shape my perception of which of this data remains relevant and which ones maybe not? And in which of the scenarios maybe is it more relevant than the other? And you will probably find that uh, it only takes you so far at the moment and that you really have to force yourself to think beyond that research data that you did. Whatever, whatever the quality of that research data was, it is not likely to fully stand up to that scrutiny now that we have uh, COVID. We're just getting a new question, which is uh, the world is changing ever so rapidly. How often sh should a corporation revise its scenarios? I think there are, there are actually, there may be two two aspects of this. One to me would be if you've developed a set of scenarios, let's say the COVID ones or other ones that you, you currently think are, are most material, 
I would revisit them, the COVID ones, on a monthly basis because this thing is moving so quickly. We are learning still on a daily and weekly basis about the virus itself. We're seeing the policy responses. We're learning about the economic responses and so on and so forth. And it doesn't have to take a huge effort to revisit them, at least track them, let's say to track them. You then have to decide if it's time where you've learned so much and some of these uncertainties that you have thought were not clear at the beginning have clarified and others have popped up that you might have to take a fresh look at them. That could come along the way. Um, I think the second aspect of this question could be, well, there might be other key uncertainties that are showing up because we're living in highly volatile times. You know, all of a sudden in two months, the US-China tensions go through the roof and we don't know where this is gonna go and the World Trade Organization falls apart and what have you. Then that might be a time where you have to craft an additional set of scenarios um, on that particular question that, that bothers you. Um, I think the best guide for that is uh, what we've tried to show before. Is it a situation where you don't have a historical point of reference and where the general consensus is, we are really not sure how this is gonna play out. It could go anyway, and if it goes the bad way, we are potentially in deep trouble and we have to adapt. That's just a very pragmatic way of making the call, at least a good time, to sit down and think through a scenario-based approach on that particular uncertainty set. I think there's, the, there's a top-quoted question uh, on what does your research say about the rate of unemployment in the next 18 months. Uh, I'm not sure if this is referring specifically to Singapore or <clears throat> globally or particular regions. Uh, so, uh, so to be honest, we, we, are not, we haven't forecasted, right? So we don't have a sophisticated employment, unemployment model, which kind of factors where it goes. Uh, my understanding is, if I take Singapore as an example, which I've been personally tracking, in the last quarter, we ended up at somewhere around, un uh, unemployment was 2.3 or 2.4 percent. It was a percent. It was about half of what it, was at the peak of SARS, uh, but partly that is because the job support scheme was still in place and uh, companies have been encouraged to take wage cuts more than actually uh, let employees go. My own personal view is that will change now as, as and when the job support scheme, uh, as companies come out of that and start looking because we do foresee, as Andreas presented, a deep recession and therefore there will be an impact. And if you look at from Singapore's perspective, the majority of the employment is in the SME sector, uh, which, uh, which will get affected. Uh, my, this is just my own personal view. If the fractured world persists uh, with that caveat, it could go uh, at least one, one and a half percentage points higher. It's, it's, it's just my own personal estimate. Uh, so definitely hitting closer to SARS levels. I don't know if uh, others have a view on that. Well, I think we, the answer is we don't know. <laughs> the, uh, I'm, I'm in a fractured world, I'm seeing structural unemployment persist for a long time. What levels they are is a function of the employment support packages that are being put in place and so on and so forth. It is very hard to tell. But it, if 2008 and 2009 started as a, as a crisis of capital, this one will become probably a crisis of labor more than it is at the moment in the short term. That's most likely what's going to happen. And I know from conversations I've had just in the last 48 hours with people who are very close to the, at least Singapore job market, that the situation at the moment in terms of people looking for op job opportunities is unprecedented. That is literally what people close to the situation told me. So with that, I think we've tried to answer, do our best to uh, answer the questions and we thank everyone for, for their patience and, uh, and listening to us. Victor, over to you. Thanks, Andreas. Uh, thank you, uh, Matthias, Anand, and also Abhijit for being with us here today to share not only your research, but also to help us understand how scenario planning is constructed and how relevant it is to businesses large and small. 
Um, it's, it's been very interesting and I know um, a lot of people um, are, are thinking about it and, and it was very interesting to see in the polls that many businesses are in the process of either thinking about it or using scenario planning. And it is certainly a good discipline when we're faced with something of the enormity of the um, depression that we are just beginning to go into. Um, so thank you very much. Appreciate your time, your expertise, and a, a clear exposition of your, your presentation documents. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, we've come to the end of this afternoon's webinar. On behalf of everybody at SICC, thank you for your company and participation. Uh, let us know how we can help you. Uh, let us know what topics, uh, what content you'd like us to deliver beyond uh, what we are already delivering. Uh, and, and you've got an email address there on the screen that you can write to us at. So I wish everybody a good weekend. Uh, keep safe and well and all the very best with your scenario planning. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.